So the session is now being recorded. Um, I wanted to get us started by briefly going through our agenda for today's session. Um, we're going to do an introduction to the panelists, and then each of the panelists is going to um, provide a um, presentation on um, the work that they've been doing around translations, whether with the carpentries or adjacent um, communities. We'll then have um, some time for um, Q&A with the panelists, and then we'll um, end with kind of talking about next steps. Um, but before I introduce our panelists, I did want to ask a couple of questions. So I'm gonna pull those up on a poll. Um, so, the first question, I'm launching the poll now, um, what level of importance would you assign to the translation of the Carpentries resources? Um, not important, important, but does not need to be prioritized, very important and should be prioritized, or extremely important and should be a top priority. So I'm just gonna give it a minute to let everyone respond and then I'll display the results. All righty. So um, you can see from the results that uh, most in attendance today feel are all <laughs> that responded to the um, poll um, agreed that this is a very important topic and, and does need to be prioritized within the community. Um, I'm now going to share another poll question. Um, we're just curious if you have done any translations of Carpentry's resources in the past. So again, just give it a little bit of time here just to get a sense of who all in the room has um, been supporting translations previously. <laughs> and I see your comment, Shawnee, that this is a very biased audience for sure. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results, but it looks like a majority in the room um, have not done any translation of Carpentry's resources, and um, we have some folks that have, so um, that's great. I think we'll have a lot of different perspectives to add to the conversation today, so thank you all so much um, for uh, filling those out for us. Um, but I am very excited to welcome our four panelists for today's session. Um, Joel Nita is at the University of Tokyo, um, a Carpentries instructor and active member in the Japan community. Uh, his research is on the ecology and evolution of ferns, which I believe he has a lovely picture of a fern behind him. <laughs> um, Gian Kamvar is the lesson infrastructure technology developer for the Carpentries, bringing data science skills to researchers worldwide. He has been publishing R packages since 2013 and is a recovering by informatician located in Beaverton, Oregon. Outside of R, he enjoys bicycle rides, speculative fiction, cats, the musical stylings of the screaming females, platelet donation, and baking. Um, Natalia Morandera, Morandera, did I say it right? I feel like I messed that up. I'm so sorry, Natalia. Um, is a Carpentries instructor and researcher in Argentina. She was co-editor of a community project for book translation to the Spanish language. Her research is on wetland ecology and remote sensing. Andrea San um, Sanchez Tapia is a Carpentries instructor and one of the leads of the Turing Way translation and localization team. Her research background is on plant ecology and biodiversity informatics. Um, so I did not do as well as I had hoped with pronunciation of everyone's name, so please repeat it when, um, when you uh, do your uh, um, presentation, but I will turn it over to you, Joel, to get us started. Hey, thank you very much, Alicia, for the uh, introduction. Uh, just a moment while I set up my screen sharing here. Okay. Does that look all right? Can everybody see my screen? Yep. And it's the, the presentation and not some random web page that I was browsing? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and get started then. 
Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be introducing um, a bit about the technology behind uh, translation at the Carpentries. And I also want to mention that you can find all of these slides online at this URL, uh, which I will uh, whoop, do, 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 put into the chat if I can select it with my mouse. Uh, uh, chat, chat, chat. Where is the chat? There it is. Okay. So yeah, I put that into the, the chat. So you can also uh, access the slides as a web page there. Okay, so how do we translate things? Well, when it comes to translating the carpentry's materials, it's not quite as simple as just rewriting text into another language, like as if we were translating a novel or something. And that's because the carpentry's lessons are what I call technical documents. So by that, I mean that they're rendered using software and therefore they present some unique challenges. So when we're dealing with technical documents, our translation system, well, for one thing, um, our translation system has certain requirements. And for one thing, these technical documents may be getting updated all the time. So we have to be able to update the translation when the original changes. And furthermore, since they're technical documents that get rendered from code, we have to deal with both the source code and then the rendered result. So you have to take that into account. Um, and there are some existing software solutions for doing this, but most tools such as um, that I'm gonna, and I'll mention these further more in the, in the, the presentation, like Git text and PO files are designed with software in mind and not prose text. Um, so, and as, as you see here, I'm mentioning a PO file, and that's important because we're gonna make use of those uh, to translate uh, the carpentry's materials. So I wanna give a quick uh, explanation of what a PO file is and how that works. So um, if we imagine our carpentry's lessons, the content of those is usually contained in MD files. So those are shown on the left side of this uh, workflow here. And you have one MD file typically um, for each, what's called an episode of the lesson. So each part of the, the lesson. Um, and in the middle here, we have what's called a PO file. And what the PO file does is it tracks every line of the original content, and then it also has a translation. So it tells you how to go from that original line to a translation of that line. And so basically you have a piece of software that takes the original MD file, and in combination with that PO file, it then can translate it onto the right side into a different language. So now we have MD files that are rendered in a different language. Um, and the reason to do this is because we now have links. Um, we have links at for each line of, of translation. So if the original changes somewhere, we can track down exactly what line changed and see where we need to update the translation. Um, so now that we've uh, understand the basics of how PO file works, I actually want to step back for a moment and discuss more broadly um, some more aspects of this technical translation. So I think, and, and these are some terms that you might see coming up um, when you're reading about uh, translation of software. Um, and people often talk about two things, internationalization and localization. And these phrases sound really similar, so they're kind of hard to tell apart, um, but they mean slightly different things. And I think it's useful to understand uh, the difference. So internationalization, and that's often abbreviated to I18N, 18 being the number of characters in the word, um, because there's a lot of characters and software engineers don't like to write long words, so they'll abbreviate to I18N. So uh, I18N is the idea that, um, or the, the process of providing the framework, the software framework to support translation. And this requires technical knowledge but it doesn't actually necessarily require linguistic knowledge. On the other hand, we also talk about localization abbreviated to L10N. And this is the process of actually translating strings or words from lang one language to another. And to do that, you don't actually have to know anything about all of the uh, technical um, infrastructure behind the scenes that's doing the translating and automating everything. All you need to do is translate from one language to another. Um, so these are two, and of course we can't, the overall process of translation uh, has to have both um, and, and they need each other, 
um, but they can be done somewhat independently. So in the past, uh, the approach that's been taken to translate carpentry's materials or lessons uh, has been the one that uses the what's called the styles format. And you should all be familiar with this if you've ever taught or taken um, a carpentry's lesson. This is what the websites look like, right? So this is a screenshot of the uh, program with Python lesson. And um, again, this is what's known as the styles format. And the styles format is based on Jekyll, along with some other tooling. Um, and so um, in the past, um, a member of the community uh, who was on the, the, the last uh, translation panel, he wasn't able to make it today, his name is David Perez Suarez. He uh, designed a translation system uh, based on a tool called PO for Gitbook uh, to translate um, these Jekyll uh, formatted websites. And if you want to find out some more information about that, you can see I have a link to his handbook here, which he kindly prepared uh, to the documentation for his system. So I just want to summarize a bit about how that works. So with this format, all the translations um, are actually controlled from a central repository that houses those PO files. And it also includes um, snapshots of all the lessons at a particular time as submodules. Now, um, this is a useful format because we can you know, track the changes with the PO files. And since everything's in one place, it's fairly easy to, to check the status of the translations. Um, however, it did have some downsides. Um, the, one of the biggest frustrations I think that was felt was that um, when the translators are translating the PO file, it's not easy to go from that to the translated website, the actual rendered website. So they couldn't see in real time what their translations actually look like. Um, and also there was no real standard system for how to edit the PO files, uh, which you can do in a text editor, um, but there's also um, software programs or online platforms that make it easier to do that, uh, such as TransFX. Um, and so there wasn't much standardization in the use of the system. And furthermore, to actually bring in all these translations together, that had to be done by one person, which was David, and <laughs> Um, it caused a bottleneck. So this is just a screenshot of the main repo that was used for handling those translations. Um, and using that system, um, there has been so many uh, language uh, communities uh, have um, translated lessons or parts of lessons, and by far the most being active being Spanish. Uh, and so those are, are listed here. Um, and I'm actually a member of the Japanese community, so I want to give a just explain a little bit about our experience with it. So we didn't use one of the online uh, platforms. We um, let everybody, each person could modify the PO file as they wanted uh, using a text editor or local software, but then we managed everything on GitHub. Um, and we did our translation review on, <coughs> excuse me, on GitHub. Uh, and so this is a screenshot of what that process looks like. Basically, um, once a person finished translating part of the PO file, they would submit that as a pull request. And then the uh, reviewers would check over the pull request and make suggestions if they thought like wording needed to be changed or something. And so uh, using that method, we were able to translate the R novice Git Gapminder uh, lesson entirely. And then we're also been working uh, recently on Git novice and shell novice. So we've been working our way through the software carpentry lessons. Um, and because we were able to successfully translate um, the complete R novice lesson, we were able to finally have our first workshop in Japanese last year, which was uh, really exciting. So uh, this is a quick summary of our this case study. Um, so things that worked well, the green stickies. Um, we found that GitHub works well for collaboration, which is no surprise because that's what it's designed for. Um, and that it's really useful to be able to do translation review in the browser. Uh, you don't have to have any local software to do that. Um, but things that didn't work so well, the red stickies. Uh, we found that requirement for Git knowledge is a really high barrier to participation. Even if you are only doing it in the browser and reviewing uh, PRs, you still need to have some basic understanding of how Git works. Um, and because of this, only a limited number of people could participate. And we really only have like a handful of active uh, translators and reviewers. And, and this leads to burnout because 
people only have so much time they can contribute as volunteers. Um, so now a turn to the, the future, <laughs> looking ahead. Uh, as you may know, um, the Carpentries lessons are being uh, rebooted <laughs> with a new format called uh, Workbench, and that's uh, being developed by Jian, who is a member of the panel today. And he's put a ton of work into this, and it's looking amazing. Uh, this is a screenshot of what the Python uh, lesson looks like in the new Workbench format. Um, and so Workbench is a complete rebuild of of Carpentry's lessons, and it does not use Jekyll. Instead, it's based on R and uh, Pandoc, in particular Pandoc-flavored Markdown. And so what this means is that the rendering of, of lessons is greatly simplified. It can all be done with a few R commands instead of lots of complicated scripts and um, use of Jekyll. And so I've taken um, advantage of this, frankly, and the system that, that Jean ha has developed um, to uh, build a um, R package that I've called Dovetail uh, to facilitate translating these lessons. So these are some, some features of this R package Dovetail. Um, some things that are different from the previous, uh, and, and particularly things that are different from the previous um, system. So it, with this approach, um, each translation is contained within each lesson. So we don't have to maintain everything in a central repository. At least that's the way I'm thinking of doing it now. That may change in the future, but I do think this uh, somewhat simplifies things, um, especially for the translators. Um, and because it uses Workbench, rendering of the lesson is of the translated lesson is easily accomplished by the translator, so they can immediately see what their translated lesson looks like. Um, and going forward, I want to have a standardized system for the translation platform for the editing of the PO files, um, possibly pushing and pulling from transcripts. Um, this is a screenshot of Dovetail uh, in use. And I won't go into the details here, just to um, emphasize that we only need uh, three or four R commands to set up the scaffolding for the translation, that is the PO files, and then to render the actual translated lesson. Um, and this is with the output that you would get. So if we were looking at a, a a lesson um, directory that contains the web, the web, uh, all the files needed to build the web page. Uh, for example, you would have some some MD files here in the in the root um, that are in the original language, and then what Dovetail adds is two folders. One is called PO and one is called locale. So PO contains the PO files that are needed for translating into a target language, and then locale contains the translated files themselves. So example, the contributing.md here would be in a different language as the contributing md here. And um, they're in subfolders by language. So for example, JA would be for Japanese, et cetera. So the, to sum up Dovetail, my design philosophy with this is I want to make it both easier for maintainers to maintain, that's the internationalization side of things, so we're not dependent on one person maintaining one central repo to control everything. It can be um, more distributed. Um, and I hope it also makes it easier for translators to translate. That's the localization side. So it should require minimal technical knowledge to participate, especially if we get this set up on an online translation platform like TransFX, then they wouldn't necessarily know need to know Git or even R. All they would need to do is um, look at the strings on on the platform and translate them into the target language. Um, and sort of big picture, what I really hope to do with this is to part uh, promote participation in the Carpentries through the act of translating. Um, by making the translation, especially the localization part of it simple, we can encourage participation and grow local communities. And that is because, especially if we want to grow communities in countries where English is not the primary language, having a translated lesson is, is basically a prerequisite to doing that, right? And I think that um, we can, that translation can be a fairly um, low stakes way to get new people involved in the community and, and, and grow the community throughout the world. Um, so yeah, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joel. That was really great to hear about that historical perspective and some of the work that's currently happening within the Carpentries. 
Um, I'm going to um, transition it now over to Jian, who's going to provide a little bit more from the Carpentries core team perspective. And I thank you, uh, thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Joel, for giving that uh, giving that introduction. Um, and I'm not going to take too much time um, because I feel that uh, more time is be better spent um, uh, hearing the other panelists talk and also uh, answering questions. Um, but the workbench uh, is we've. We've been designing the workbench um, with the idea that translations will be um, integrated into the workbench, and I think uh, Joel really picked up on that and um, and developed something that has a lot of potential and has a lot uh, that will be really useful um, moving forward, um, especially with the with the idea that um, the all of the that the rendering can can happen uh, on the translator's computer. They don't have to worry about um, they don't have to worry about what the website's going to look like in the end, or they can use uh, TransFX. And really, um, it's the reason why um, we have not done trans uh, we have not uh, set up a framework yet. Um, from the carpentry side is really because um, we don't we don't have the expertise on the on the staff side, um, and this is this is really something that we need to that we are investing in. Um, from what I recall, um, there are. I apologize. I have something loud on my lap. Um, we have so we are. Um, working on grants, there are grants in the work that will be supporting translations um, uh, specifically, uh, and will uh, hopefully uh, get us get us resources that we can we can um, use to uh, to bring these translations um, to the workbench. And really, our goal is. Is uh, to make sure that it, it's the same. It's the exact same goal as as Joel has presented. Um, that we want to make sure that uh, people who are doing the translations only need to focus on doing the translations, and that the whole whole process is seamless. And really, eventually, um, we want to get to the point where um, we have a system where not only you can where we are translating from English to any other language, but we want to go the other way around. And so, if you think about it, um, you have a le you have a lesson in Japanese, you have a lesson in Spanish, and you have learners, you have instructors who want to modify that lesson. They create a pull request, but if the source is in English, then uh, they need to know English in order to create the pull request. So how do they create, how do they at, we want to develop a system to, for people to be able to add suggestions in their own language and have it be able to be propagated. And this is a difficult problem. You, you want to modify one thing with multiple streams of information and have it propagate to, to everything else. And I think these are, these are some of these these are some of the challenges that um, that we're we're trying to think about. That's going to that are going to come up. Um, that have that have appeared already uh, with our current translation efforts. Um, and so uh, this is this is where um, I apologize. <laughs> um, this is. Uh, this is the this is the direction that these are these are a lot of the challenges that we're that we're facing um, as we're developing the workbench, as we're um, moving along, and there are a lot of different solutions out there, um, but not all none of them are perfect. Um, and uh, for example, if you look at if you look at translations via Jekyll, if you look at translations via Hugo, 
they all do very different things. And they all uh, expect you to set it up in a different way. Um, and it's not standardized. And it's, it's very, it can be difficult to work with the community. And um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the community can work with this. And this is why um, we're moving slowly uh, and carefully, because if we develop a system that doesn't work for that, that people can't access, then it's not worth it. it if we develop a system that people can't access, then um, that's effort and time wasted. And this is why we're moving carefully. And I apologize that it, it my this may seem like verbal. Um, uh, this this may <laughs> This is kind of may seem like a verbal tornado um, with things flying around, with concepts and things flying around everywhere. But um, I just wanted to give you a feeling of kind of all the things that we have to consider uh, in order to in order to get the translations right, including including um, who translates, where they translate, and where the translations are deployed, and how feedback is is. Uh, ported through the system, and I really appreciate. And I didn't want to step on previous efforts of um, of translations. I didn't want to step on Debbie's efforts, and I and I don't I don't want to uh, step on Joel's efforts of these of these translations. And I don't want to step on the efforts of the of the Spanish translations that have happened uh, early on. Um, and uh, so. What I hope to do is I'm hoping to listen to the community and understand where the, where I can apply where can I where where I can apply my skills uh, to help bring translations into the workbench in an equitable manner in a way that people don't have to worry about um, knowing Git or knowing uh, or knowing English uh, in order to in order to do translations. Um, I'm going to stop there because really I could I could ramble on, but it's better for it's better for me to hear from the community. It's better for the community to speak. Um, and we'll address questions during the question and answer phase. Uh, so back to you, Alicia. Great, thanks so much, Xi'an. Um, our next two panelists are going to transition us a little bit to talk about um, adjacent efforts to do translation. Um, and so, uh, Natalia, I'm going to turn it over um, to you to present on some of the work that you are um, engaged in. Thank you, Alicia. I'm sharing my screen here. And in the chat, I'm sharing the link to the slides. So today I'm talking about uh, tips from our experience translating tech and education materials into Spanish. Uh, this uh, talk is co-authored with Janina Bejini Saivene. And uh, first, uh, well, we all know that language here in, the, in this session, that language is a barrier in a lot of regions where English is not the first language. And uh, co collaborative translations have been used both for for open software, for lesson, lessons such as the carpentries, for books and other materials. Our experience and this talk is based uh, mainly on uh, the last translation we have conducted in a, in a community. That was the book by uh, Greg Wilson, Teach, uh, Teaching Tech Together. We translated the book into Spanish during uh, 2020. And also, Shanina has uh, been involved in the translation of the R for Data Science book and uh, of the R Ladies Rule and Guideline. So first, um, si since uh, translating a book, or uh, uh, I'm, I'm structuring the talk in 10 tips uh, to share with you. And uh, the first uh, tip is to have a motivation, a clear motivation in the group. Since the translation of a book or of a series of lessons, uh, of lessons is a long process, the aim of mo and motivation should be clear. 
for example, you, you can have uh, community motivation, such as make the material accessible for our communities and use it in uh, specific workshops or tutorials. And also personal motivation, such as uh, studying the content while translating and discussing it with peers and um, also with the author of the original material. Our second tip is to uh, seek for the author of the original book or material consent. Um, in countries, this is uh, easy because the materials have a, a license that allow derivative work and uh, allow translation. But in some kind of materials, you need to um, look for the, the approval of the author of the editorial. And also, if you the author of the original material is um, available and is, um, is OK with the translation, you can have uh, him, her, or uh, them uh, available for queries, such as, what did you mean by this uh, very local expression? And plus, the author can receive uh, contributions from the translators. For example, in our book, our main contribution was to suggest to include alt text in the in the original material that were not not included. Next, um, we think that it's very uh, important to share and document the agreements on how to translate. Um, taking a term from the Shell talk, uh, this is more related to localization. So first how to the work is uh, uh, organized. Here is a conceptual map uh, which shows, uh, for example, that the team has several roles such as coordination, uh, translators, reviewers, and editors, where we can discuss doubts, uh, discuss how to translate the term, what are the deadlines, and also some um, agreements and consents on grammar, orthography, punctuation, the use of non sexist language, uh, how to translate figures, how to construct uh, alt text, uh, what terms in English are to be kept in English, and what terms are to be translated, and uh, which is the, the, the term that we are uh, using for that um, translation. The people names, for example, uh, some in the, the book we were translating, there were some um, learning personas with names, and we decided to change the names uh, for names more related to Latin American people. Which people is responsible for each chapter? What is the translation? How is the translation progress? And how to um, cite and, and the, the material. Next, that this is something that the previous uh, presenters share with me and have presented uh, very good, that to keep the, the, the focus on the translation and not on the tool. And we agree that GitHub is a barrier for, uh, for our team, it was a barrier. So, so we used uh, Google Docs with all <laughs> the limitations uh, but uh, the the easiest um, the easiest tool uh, allowed to a, a bigger a bigger community a larger community to participate and to decide what tool to use uh, it's very important to discuss how important is to prioritize version control updates to preview the material if we are using a new uh, tool. Uh, maybe the team needs to be trained. And also, uh, some members of the team can help other team members to use the tools or to adapt the text if they can't uh, access, the, they, if they can't use a tool because of accessibility or because of their particular skills. Next, uh, in Spanish, at least, uh, using inclusive and non sexist language is very important because we have um, nouns uh, that are different in for for females and for um, uh, for males. 
So we had to discuss a lot about how to translate uh, nouns and adjetivos, no me sale la palabra. And uh, we seek for advice from experts. We study materials, adjectives, thank you. And we discussed what, which was the better uh, option to include our audience, but also to be inclusive in our um, in our translation. And finally, we documented the decision to be consistent consistent in the chapters. Next, uh, baby steps: dividing the work in very small tasks chapters, sections, and uh, Shanina that led the, the translation gave us a Sunday report, Sunday report uh, with the progress of the, um, of the translation and also she tracked the contributions. Next, uh, flexibility, don't be literal. In English, I mean, I think that in, in most languages there are a lot of um, phrases, and uh, for example, if we didn't want to be to translate them literal. Sometimes we had to discuss a lot what was the meaning of the of the phrase. For example, this was a, an example that took a lot of uh, discussion on on our Slack channel. Uh, the original phrase says said it if it look as though what we are what they are critiquing took hours to create most will pull their punches and since this is not a literal boxing example we had to uh, ask uh, the author a bilingual person and google for the meaning to translate it more similar to soften their criticisms also we were we were not literal with uh, example for example uh, the, this um, original phrase um, was uh, with Vancouver, Victoria, um, British Columbia, and these are cities, um, Vancouver and Victoria are cities that we don't uh, know in, in, Latin, in Latin America. So we translated uh, the phrase uh, using Rio de Janeiro, Brasilia, and the country Brazil. And also in some opportunities, we uh, changed uh, the, the examples. Uh, for example, this is an example of a, um, an exercise with a phrase. And we used, uh, we changed the, the original phrase by um, a phrase of a, an Argentinian poet and singer and artist. Uh, and to be, to have the example more familiar and more funny. And, uh, also, this allows us to disseminate our Latin American artists and our culture. Other example is when the, in the text it said, uh, "Take a break and have a take a break and have a coffee." We said, "Have a coffee or a mate or a terere." That are typical drinks in our countries. This is our example: the a person problem that was a, a translation from English to Frisian. We didn't know what Frisian was, <laughs> and we translated the the trans the person problem with a translation from Spanish Castilian Spanish to Catalan from Catalonia. And also linguistic di diversity um, terms such as uh, green beans and uh, green beans can have a lot of translations in uh, in, uh, in Spanish. So a diverse language needs a diverse translating team, and we call members from a lot of uh, countries. So maybe one person translated the test uh, from Argentina, and then uh, uh, a Bolivian uh, peer revised the, the, the text. We have also created a bilingual glossary. Uh, this is a, the link to the Shiny app, where uh, you can uh, find um, the, the translation from English to Spanish and also the definitions in English and in Spanish of the technical terms. And finally, build a community around the translation project. Uh, the team members were from Our Lady, the Carpentry Metal Essencia, and some 
some of uh, us were not involved in any community, but we grow a, a new community that uh, was related to the translation of the book that is Enseñar Tecnología en Comunidad. And we had a Slack channel, we had roles. Uh, we didn't have, but we recommend to have a code of conduct and some accessibility diversity statement and social meetings and celebrate the achievement. And lastly, since I am from the academia, uh, I um, um, it's important for, for me and for uh, some most of us to um, have this our our achievements also uh, shown in our resumes. So this is, for example, the Sasha citation of the translated book. Thank you very much. Um, we are available for questions, both Shanina and I. Great, thank you so much, Natalia. That was great. It's so wonderful to always hear on, you know, tips and things from others have learned doing these um, same processes that uh, we're trying to do um, at the Carpentries. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Andrea, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what the Turing Way has been doing um, to support translations in their community. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad for the invitation. And I am glad that Natalia spoke earlier because there is part of their work that has inspired our work. And it's nice to see how how communities at the end communicate each other because we are at some point we are we also had the carpentries documentation for translation at the Turing Way and we discussed it. So there have been efforts at the Turing Way that have that have been also inspired by, by your work. Um, so uh, my name is Andrea Sanchez Tapia and I will share my screen. Uh, I think this is it. So uh, for, for those of you who are not uh, uh, familiar with the Turing Way, the Turing Way is a, is a community and it's a collaborative guide to data science and research, especially for open scholarship. And it's a, a book that is built by uh, the community. It's based uh, at the Turing Institute in the UK, which is like the National Institute for, for Artificial in Intelligence and Computational uh, things. And um, there's a community around this guide. It was, it was created uh, three years ago. And the idea is that the whole community can build uh, uh, the content. And uh, so it is in itself, before we talk about its translation, it is already a large collaborative um, effort that has some of the problems that we're talking about, like technical parts and content parts. So it's, it's in itself before the translation. It's, uh, it's complex, like the carpentry's lesson infrastructure. And we are trying to, to create, a, um, to involve and to support a diverse community. And this also necessarily includes people who, for whose language, first language is not English, like, like most of us at the end. Um, so um, uh, I will, the, the Turing Way has several guides. It started as a reproducibility guide, but, uh, but the topics uh, expanded and now it has several, several other guides uh, that talk about project design and communication and ethical research. And the idea is that anyone can make a PR and, and propose a chapter and uh, uh, teams build and collectively you can write parts of the content. And, and it's, the idea is that the community is at, at the back of it. So there are lots of, of um, conversations about the governance right now, and there's a lot of, of governance work inside, and translation has been part of this uh, talk. Um, so now we have more than 300 di direct contributors in GitHub and, and uh, thousands of users. Um, and uh, one of the pathways for collaboration, and as Natalia said, uh, translate Translating is a form of community building. Translating is a way of reading and of, of studying the content and uh, of making global the content. Uh, so uh, translation is part of, it's a key part for, for, the, for the 
for expanding the reach of the guide and to expand the communication, the community and the, and the community building of, of the Turing Way. In addition to the technical parts and of the, of the content uh, creation and the review and update of, of the content. Um, so what happened with us is that uh, there were uh, previous efforts in Spanish and in Japanese, and they were at least partly inspired by the Carpenters documentation. When you look at this history of the, of the issues and of the pull requests, you see lots of links going back and forth about how to, how to translate the Turing way. And um, there was also a Korean team and a Turkish initial uh, effort. And this chosen platform for, for, for doing this was Transifex. And Transifex worked, uh, worked well, especially, especially, and again, the community that worked in Spanish translations was super active. Um, but but uh, at some point it became outdated because it had been built on top of a commit. Basically they had branched and Transifex was, we had technical, the technical part was, was a little bit complex. And, um, and the Turing Way started to change very quickly. So we had the problem of we needed of, of, of needing to, to, to keep the content updated. Um, and um, also there were a demand, there was a demand for other languages. And, um, and especially we have a colleague uh, and, and a community uh, that works in Arabic that wants to do the translations in Arabic and Transifex, as far as we know, until the point that we decided to change from Transifex to crowding did not have support for right to, to left languages. So this was part of the of the of the of the of the decision of going out of that transifex and try to restart the whole workflow. And one of the issues was, was how not to lose previous translations, especially in Spanish, how not to lose what was done in transifex. Um, so what we decided was to switch to Crowdin and to explore the options and the different workflows that Crowdin uh, has and, and exploring how machine translation can help us with the first part of the translation. And then each one would uh, help um, refine the, the translation. And we switch, so we switched from Crowdin and we set up uh, basically a fork that uh, keeps that keeps pulling from the original guide. So this is was this is the simplest technical part. Is we we have a, a fork of the guide that is being updated and it pulls it pushes to crowding, and uh, it's a little bit daunting. Sometimes you feel a little bit worried because it because you're never the progress is so slow and and you're having constant updates. But this is the only way to not to to avoid making it outdated. Uh, and in November, in November, the, the Turing Way has uh, two book dashes per year. And in November of the last year, um, four of us gathered together to think about this workflow. So it was Camila. Camila was present here at the last conversation. And uh, we have Alejandro Coca and uh, Batul Almarzouk, who is the person who, whose first language is Arabic. And, um, and we were trying to split the part to, to to organize the team between the technical parts of the repo and how to keep it updated with crowding and how to deploy to Netlify, which because uh, the Turing way is deployed in Netlify in multi-language settings, uh, having a, a multilingual version of the, of the, of the guide. Um, and at the end, it became also, um, we decided to open the effort and to welcome more people and to welcome language team leads. If any language has the demand, then a small community for only this language has, has, has to be able to come in. It has to be uh, an entry point for the community. So at the end, what we are working also is a lot on the governance of this team, of this community. And so we are welcoming other, other teams that have uh, special specific uh, languages. So for example, we have now a Turkish team and we have a Portuguese team and we have a Spanish team that was previously there. There's a person who is the language uh, team lead or a couple of people that, that go back and forth, uh, especially because the technical parts should not be 
mixed with the with the translation part. So some people are just there to translate in, in crowding. And we as colleagues want to help with the technical part and to and to be supportive of the community that are only going to be translating. So, so we are trying to, to create this structure. And the idea is that anyone can fit in the structure as they wish. Some people are more attracted to the technical part. Some people want to translate, and that's okay. And this should be this, this should be uh, uh, open. Um, and inspired by the work of teaching tech together translation to Spanish, who made uh, the guidelines for Spanish, for example, the part where you try to use non-gendered language for gendered languages. Um, and, we, and when you try to, to make the localization part where it's culturally uh, sensitive, where, where, what it means, we are trying to, uh, to create guidelines for each language. So each team of different languages is trying to document the, the decisions. We are using a lot of glossario, the glossario from the carpentries for the technical part. It's a great resource for everyone, and we, but we are also trying to make uh, that every team has sort of this kind of document, like what were the decisions, linguistically speaking. This, this should be able to be a, a resource uh, outside of the Turing way too. So we have, we have some, some of these guidelines for Arabic and Turkish right now, and we are working on the Portuguese ones. The Spanish, the Spanish one is not being rebuilt because Teaching Tech Together has, and, and in English, we, we are not redoing the, the work. We're inspiring heavily. So we have right now a lot of documentations. We have a weekly meeting for all the for all the for all the people. We try to block two hours a week, and the people uh, should be able to go and and translate a little bit and say hi, hang around. Uh, and sometimes these meetings are a meeting of of technical sites. So sometimes we open a breakout room and discuss the deployment or discuss, we're going to discuss some, some, some technical issues. Uh, but it's also a way to, for us to hang out, to hang out, to, to, to be together and to do this together. And we have, so we have lots of notepads uh, like this one in, in, in this current conversation. We, we check in, we talk a little bit and we, we do the translations. We are also having, I am, I am, we have a draft of the governance for the team. And this is being discussed in addition to the whole governance of the whole Turing way. And we have a separate GitHub organization with our fork for the whole guide and our structure for subfolders uh, for each language. And um, we are also writing a preview of uh, the chapter. We have a chapter documenting the whole process of, of how to translate. We want it to be an entry point, an easy entry point that people who go into, into, into the Turing way can read the chapter and find the whole documentation and, and, and are not afraid to interact with us and, and, and say, hey, I want to do this. Uh, we have the challenge of, of in addition to the governance, um, of the acknowledgement of the work that everybody's doing. And we are having a little bit of trouble with Netlify, but it's a question of our expertise because we are not from, from, from some areas and, and, and maybe the Turing way is going to change the way it deploys. So, so this has to be talked in addition to the whole infrastructure for the whole Turing way. Um, but that's it, mostly what I wanted to show you. I have lots of links. I can, I can later put them on the note, but then I'm ready. If you want to discuss anything, we can talk more. Great, thanks so much, Andrea. Um, I think all of these presentations demonstrate how much I think we can all learn from each other and all the work that we're doing um, to inform, um, you know, kind of the best path forward for all of our communities and doing this work. Um, so thank you all so much. Very, very much appreciate it. Um, we're going to transition now into the um, asking questions of the panelists. Um, if this session, similar to the first session, um, the panelists asked questions of each other, um, so this is encouraged as well, um, but uh, I know some folks have been adding questions to the Etherpad. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'll start with one of um, those questions and we can kind of move around a little bit, but um, if you do have a question for the panelists, 
feel free to add um, that into the chat or you can also um, raise your hand. Um, I am going to copy the first question into the chat so that you all have it, but I will also read it out loud. So the first question, um, how will the Carpentries core team support the maintenance of lessons and languages that aren't used by core team members themselves? Does the core team pose an intrinsic, intrinsic bottleneck to translation and internationalization efforts? I think that's my, I think that's a question that I'm suited to answer. Um, and um, I think the answer to most of these questions for me is going to start with, I don't know. Um, but uh, I will say that I don't think I I don't think that um, the core team is going to propose pose an intrinsic bottleneck to translation internationalization efforts. Um, simply for the fact that um, the core team is here to support uh, the community efforts. Um, we are not here to do the. We are not here to write the content. Uh, we're not here to teach the content. Uh, we're here to support. Uh, people who are passionate about um, about teaching data science, um, and so the community can grow, um, and it would be it would really be up to the community um, to perform these translation and internationalization efforts, uh, much like we have in the Glossario project. Um, we have several editors in different languages. Uh, for example, Batul um, helps translate the um, help helps with the Arabic translations. Um, uh, she's been doing a really fantastic job at um, at moderating those and giving giving really helpful feedback. Um, and there are we have um, we have other people who are working uh, uh, for translations um, in Afrikaans. Uh, in Spanish uh, and many other languages, and so really, what uh, it's the community that that um, is going to support these. Um, and uh, it's up to the core team uh, to help support those communities and make sure those communities have the resources that they need to uh succeed and this is i believe this is one of the this is one of the directions that we we are going with the grants that we've applied for um to help support uh the internet internationalization community um i hope that answers the question if it doesn't uh please shout out tell me um but i i'd also be interested to hear from the other core team members if the, if if my answer was completely wrong <laughs> I, I can add a little bit to this question based on some of the conversation that happened during the first translations panel. Um, but I had brought up, um, you know, from since I'm the, um, you know, director of community and leading the community development team, what can be my role, um, not thinking about the technology side but making sure when we're thinking about documentation and um, being sure that everyone's aware of where things stand and that we continue to maintain that transparency um, across you know, what we're doing, what we're working on and what the community um, is uh, interested in and prioritizing and how we best support that. Um, and so I'm really um, interested in um, looking at having a space um, similar to what Andrea was saying, that the Turing Way meets weekly, and not that we would need to meet weekly, but I, I would like to start maybe bringing members of the Carpentries community together and maybe inviting others from these other adjacent efforts to these conversations to just kind of um, keep sharing what we're working on, what we're learning from our different efforts that have been ongoing, um, how we can um, share you know, what's working, what's not working, um, and at least creating a space at a minimum um, to have those conversations and even potentially start working on um, some of this documentation. Um, right now, I think it's even a little bit difficult to um, find the documentation that has already been developed by the community 
around translations within the carpentries. And so even identifying the best way um, to raise, you know, awareness of the resources that are already out there and what people have already been doing, um, I think is a really good first step. Um, but I just wanted to add that piece and it looks like Carrie has her hand as well. Yes, just briefly from a, a fundraising perspective, this this effort, it, it will take funding because we need a, a dedicated staff member who has at least 25 to 30% of their role that will, will help um, coordinate efforts among the community. And so um, part of, also part of what we're doing is we have two, two openings right now um, for a, an information technology developer and also a director of technology. And so we'll be building into those roles, um, some of the efforts around translation and inter internationalization from a, from a infrastructure perspective, but also just in terms of, of community and volunteerism, you know, translating lessons, this is a lot of work. And I would, I personally would like to offer or to incentivize, incentivize or offer some sort of incentive for individuals who wanna get involved. And we're looking at different grants. There's one I've just looked at where um, nonprofits can bring on a fellow. We would apply for this grant and we would be able to have a fellow who could work for the carpentries for two years. So those are the kind of um, out the box you know, thinking that we're trying to do, apply for apply for this funding where we could bring on a fellow and have someone focus on translations, you know, building both the infrastructure and the community pieces, having a dedicated staff member to do it. So we're, we're looking at a lot of options and Gian brought it up earlier, just from a fun, funding perspective, we need money to be able to place um, someone in a role on the core team that can support the, the activities. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing from a fundraising perspective. I wanted to be sure if anyone had any follow-up questions related to that initial question after some of these responses or any comments before I move on to the next, next question. Um, Andrea. Maybe I'll just say quickly that um, at the Turing Way, part of this discussion may, made us core team. The way it works, the way it works, uh, it, it, we, it, it ended uh, as we, like the, rec the recognition was for now was like, come here. And so, so we have the people who are doing the translation became part of the conversation. And this is something that I would like to that, that that might help with the, what Jeanne was saying that ideally some part of the content at some point in the future can be created in other languages and come back. So not only from English, that would be awesome. Great, thanks so much, Andrea. Okay, I'm gonna to transition to the next question um, on the etherpad. Um, so uh, related to Gian's comments about translations being di bi-directional, does the community anticipate that a lesson might have different ideal forms for different locales apart from the language of the lesson? For example, different relevant examples, different levels of detail, different analogies. Um, and there's a comment here that Natalia had addressed that in um, her slides as well on flexibility and using locally relevant examples um, uh, as part of the translation process. Um, so, um, Gian, I think that's um, back over to you and I, I'll copy the question into the chat so that you have it there as well. Actually, I, um, I'm not quite sure how to answer this piece. I think there, there can, this is, this is one of those things where you can't have one uh, as, as Andrea, Danina, Dalia have pointed out, you can't have just one translation of Spanish. Um, and uh, I, I would rather hear from the community though, because uh, I'm not the community. I'm, uh, 
I think there, there are different ways of addressing this um, from the technical side, but I'd, I'd like to hear about this from um, what the community thinks about like having ideal forms in different locales. Um, this may be something, Joel, I just say while you unmute, <laughs> but I, I know that this is something you had talked about a lot too in terms of the complexity of doing the translations and ensuring that that context is applied when, when doing them. Yeah, well, just one thought is that um, I think this is sort of already happening even outside of strictly translation. So there's plenty of um, people or, or groups that have forked uh, Carpentry's lessons and adapted them to their needs in their community um, that maybe they don't, that they prefer to use a different file as an example data or um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, or maybe they're teaching some like um, HPC kind of things and their cluster has some different um, setup than somewhere else. So they'll modify it uh, and there's, nothing wrong with that we can have endless amounts of forks potentially um but i think the real difficult technical question is do we want to have some sort of like central source of truth or are we okay with having a multiverse of of lessons and not necessarily worrying about uh, having one central thing um so there's different ways to approach that i think but I, I think it can be thought of more as a more general problem than maybe just translating. Great, thanks so much, Joel. Erin, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, really tentatively. So this is my question um, that I put on the Etherpad. I, I do think about this. I, I really appreciate your perspective on it, Joel, that it's not just about translations. It really is about how um, individual communities and individual classrooms adapt the lessons for their own specific learners, which is what we teach in instructor training, right? So teach to the room that you have, not the room that you you think you have or think you should have. Um, and I really like that. And I'm also on the back burner of my brain thinking about how we on the core team represent um, our lessons to uh, potential members and potential funders and like how we talk about the official Carpentries lessons and make statements about what they are and what they do um, in a way that we couldn't as um, like authoritatively like not that's not the word I'm looking for it would be harder to make statements about the overall quality and the overall um, learner profile of our lessons if we're thinking about it in terms of this multiverse that you're talking about, Joel. So if I'm talking to um, a potential member organization and they want to know about our lessons, at this point in time, I'm able to speak about the content of all of our official lessons, but I would not definitely not be able to do that um, in this kind of like multiplicity universe which is not to say that I think the multiplicity isn't a good thing and isn't the direction we should be moving. It just means that I'm gonna have to shift the way that I think about and represent our lessons to potential members and potential funders. And I really wanna think about how to do that as we kind of move into this universe. Are there any other comments about that? Andrea? I, I will come back quickly to, to the part where, uh, where the translations in, in Spanish are multiple and you have to take decisions. And uh, at the end, I, I, don't think the, I don't think the conclusion is that there is not only one, like in, in the context of developing software, you will have really like Mexico Spanish and, and, and Spanish Spanish, and uh, you have a couple of versions, but in the context of what we of here, what we're doing here, we can very, very live with one version and and and, and a text that is understandable uh, by by everyone. So, uh, so I, I don't know if that works for other languages that have multiple uh, ramifications, I, uh, such as Arabic that has 
uh, different oral versions, but I don't know if this, if this, if the written norm is the same, I don't know how it works. But for Spanish, for example, if you're going to give out uh, energy, you, you stick with one version that suits more or less the whole community and, and you use energy for creating another language like, like between Portuguese and Brazil, there are clear differences like the, the Portuguese, uh, the versions of Portuguese are more different between them than the Spanish versions, but nobody's going to do both. Like it's very difficult. We, we are going to stick with a version that is like uh, community driven, and if there are more Brazilians than Portuguese people in some communities, that's the translation that sticks. And sometimes it's the Portuguese European and, and uh, that has the norm, like from some African countries that, that they, they do the translation. So we live with that. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. And Joel just added um, something into the chat related to setting up PO files, you can use a locale for a given language. And I added that into the etherpad. So thank you for that, Joel. Yeah, I don't know if it would address all of the needs of the Spanish uh, language community, but uh, there, at least, for example, that's how they do it on Transifix. They use this, oh no, if you click on that link, they also mention this ISO standard, um, which I believe is like a standard set of locales and languages. Um, so there is some amount of, of specificity there. But again, I don't know if that's sufficient or not. Great. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, I wanted to pull a question from the chat that Trevor had asked. Um, are there ways for those of us fluent in just one language help out with the internationalization efforts? From the polls, it seems all of us here feel these efforts should have high priority, yet few of us have contributed so far. Um, I will, I guess, um, start answering that question going back to kind of what I was um, talking about previously in terms of um, starting to have a space where we can have these conversations. Um, I think that this is something with those that are already active in translation in the community, we can learn from them as to what the existing workflows are, where there um, are specific needs, um, and even using those conversations to help inform some of the work of the infrastructure team um, by gathering all that knowledge from all of you and feeding that to them as they're starting to, um, you know, build some of this into infrastructure as funding and resources become available. Um, but Joel, you have your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I would also say that it, well, it depends on each individual's abilities and, and where they think they can contribute, but there's plenty of things on that I-18N side, the, the infrastructure side, that you don't have to know anything about a particular language to help with. So for example, if you want to do, you know, help contribute to this project, this package that I've been working on, um, that would be great, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, I, I think in order to do that, you know, you might need to be able to test it out and see how it behaves with certain languages and things like that. So it'll, it would be a collaborative effort, um, but there's plenty of things to do. Uh, it also like documentation, et cetera, et cetera. So other things that um, people can, can help um, contribute toward translation without actually, um, yeah, knowledge of, a, of the second language. Natalia, you have your hand. Yeah, um, I, uh, in our team, we had not all, not all of us were uh, fluent in English. Uh, all of us were very fluent in Spanish, and we had some bilingual uh, members, but um, we didn't require it, um, to be the, the, the team members to be uh, fluent in English. Uh, we only wanted them to uh, be um, um, able to read a technical uh, education pedagogy, pedagogy text, uh, understand it, and um, if so, they can translate it with, with thought, they can translate it into Spanish. And we also had a triple check um, system. So first one person translated the test, then we had at least one re reviewer um, in most cases, two reviewers, and last, uh, the editor, Janina and I, 
read all the book and look for how it sounded, if, if it's okay. So maybe some of the translations were not uh, very um, good, uh, but we corrected them among us. Yeah, I, I just like to build on that really great comment there a little bit that I think it is very important to have, it, this is kind of straying from the original question because it's about the translating aspect of when you do have that knowledge, but there's different levels of knowledge of a second, of a second language. Uh, for example, in my case, um, I'm not a native Japanese speaker, so I don't feel as comfortable translating directly into Japanese, but I can definitely do the, the reviews and the checks and, and I can help spot if maybe things didn't quite line up. Um, so there's many different roles for, for different people. Um, thanks for that, Joel. And I want to be cognizant of our time. We only have eight minutes left. <laughs> I think we can talk about these topics for forever. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a qu another um, comment about the bi-directional translation. I, we've spoken about that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to skip over that for now. Um, there was a question asking about Glossario, and Shani and Natalia responded to that question in the Etherpad. Um, so just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Um, but I wanted to ask this next question, and again, I'll um, paste it into the um, chat here. But from the human perspective, how do you keep the translation work sustainable when the original materials are constantly changing? We have a, a tiny agreement in the Turing way that when it works very good, it will still have a delay from the original content. So it will be versioned and no, like there's no expectation. It's not realistic to expect that it will keep up the same pace. We are, we are still struggling with the first part of the translation and, and the moment where everything is going to be translated. At, at least for the size of the Turing way, is not going to be happening soon. But still, supposing that we finish 100% of some version, we are ready to have like a month, like several months uh, delay for that. And, and uh, they'll like accept that and, and have it documented. Like this is a version that you're reading right now, because otherwise you're just, uh, just, just setting up yourself for, for permanent uh, feelings of, in, uh, of incompleteness, yeah. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, Shani? Yeah, I think that we we should use the, the roles that we have for maintain a lesson in English and have maintainers of the language. Uh, for the books that I participate, this work is uh, normally the, the person or the the people who do the final edition is the maintainer. So for R4DS, Riva Quiroga is the one who made the, the updates to the book when the original books in English happen. I'm the one who do the, the changes on, on T3. And in the case of teaching tech together, uh, Greg is the one who translate to English the changes and improvement that we did in Spanish. So that is how it does work. But for a book, perhaps it's more easy because changes are less and you change perhaps for a second edition or third edition uh, than for a lesson. But I think that for carpentries, I think that is a good idea to have a space to chat about this, to have a space where we can find everything that we are actually doing for translation. So we can take advantage of all the effort the community is willing to do because we need the lesson in our language. Otherwise we can teach and we want to teach. But right now I feel that it is kind of, we are not focusing in an efficient and pragmatic way all the effort that we are doing. Uh, and I'm speaking for the Spanish more than the other languages. So I think that we, we can start to tidy that 
and and then know where we can focus an effort to to be able to do this. Uh, we are going to do a better use of our community and our time as a volunteer. Uh, yeah. So I'm very grateful for the people who organize this panel and for the people who come here to to tell what they are doing and all their experience, uh, because I think that is something that we need uh, as a human beings, <laughs> not as a carpentry community also. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for talking about this and for doing this and work on this. Thanks so much for your comments, um, Shawnee. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll definitely be um, sending out some communications through the various channels to try to identify at least a, an additional time outside of these sessions that we can come together and talk about how often we might like to meet and who all uh, might be good to, to have. Again, I know there are so many adjacent communities that are um, having some of the same challenges that were presented today with a lot of the work that has been um, been done. Um, because we do have a lot of other questions being added, is there one that anyone's added that you really would like to have answered in the last three minutes of our time together? Okay, well, I'm going to ask um, the panelists um, to respond to the questions that have been added if we can't get through them. Um, but also wanted to let everyone know questions that were asked during the first session and the notes from the first session are also on this ether pad. So I invite you all um, to look in um, at that as well. Um, it looks like there is a question it says maybe for Joel and it looks like all of you are continuing to add answers um, to the questions that have been asked, but um, how would you link linguistic guidelines agreements to the dovetail tool? Yeah, thanks for that question. So actually, I don't really see that sort of thing as being within the scope of dovetail. And that actually brings up an important point. And this is related to something that Gian mentioned earlier, is that since we don't, is that it's, it's very important to come up with a well-designed infrastructure to manage these translations. And that's not an easy problem. Um, that said, the flip side of that, I think, is that in our local communities, especially non-English communities, um, having translations is really important and an urgent need if we're going to do the carpentries. <laughs> um, so I think that we need, in, in order to, to uh, you know, take both of these things into account, um, I think taking a modular approach is important. So for example, for Dovetail, I see is that having a fairly narrow scope, it's just there to help you translate using PO files in the workbench. Um, and then how that ultimately gets implemented is that, does that mean we have all the PO files in a central repo? Are those handled in different individual lesson repos, et cetera? We can deal with that down the road later, but the, uh, but what this, because this has uh, one job to do, so it's sort of like programs in Bash, like where you can chain those together in a pipeline because they're modular and they're flexible without having to worry about the big picture within a particular tool. Um, so that was my long answer. <laughs> and I think those guidelines are super important, but I think they should go somewhere else. Great, thanks so much, Joel. Um, with our minute left, I didn't know if any of the panelists had any final thoughts or comments. Thank you all again so much for being here today. Um, but, uh, well, we, it looks like we ran out of time. I guess if you wanna add a sentence <laughs> or something to, to close out, no pressure, but just wanna give you um, space to um, say any last words if you would like to. And also give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. I, my last word would be thank you so much to all the panelists and for Alicia for organizing and everyone who participated today. Really appreciate it. It was fantastic.